cast for magic. We come to the Pope on Film podcast to laugh, to cry, to care, because we need that. All of us. That indescribable feeling we get, which I'm describing literally right now. So how describable are we talking about here? That indescribable feeling we get when the Liz a Day theme song begins to play and we go somewhere we've never been before. Not just entertained, but somehow reborn. <laughs> Dazzling images on a small Twitch stream, stream, sound that is sound, somehow, Amaland horse erotica feels good in a podcast like this. Bunny Williams feels like the stoned parts of us, and May Lynn feels perfect and powerful because here they are. The Pope on Film podcast. We make movies better. And with me is Good morning, Pope on Film. <laughs> hey, this is not a test. This is pretty bad movies. Hey, um, I am the Pope in question. My name is Reverend May Lynn. I am the founder of the Church of Edwood, which is an actual thing worth a Google. Uh, this is episode 464 of the podcast, and, uh, wow, what an incredible new, uh, little intro video. Yes, this, uh, is the beginning of the podcast, which is the monologue, which we call Jeff, a.k.a. the Betty White Memorial Podcast segment brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends Download today. Looks great, Bunny. Thank you. Oh, and look at how the words are just spinning around. Oh, it looks amazing. It looks amazing. I really like it. Uh, Bunny, uh, to start off with, I have a real quick question for you. Yes. Is there another word for thesaurus? Uh, I, 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 I believe so, but it's a, it, it's like one of those MJ-17 things. So, okay. like, like, if you find out what the other word is for thesaurus, they will kill yeah. you. Nice. Nice. Good to know. Uh, but I mean, Just like all the blue food. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be an exciting podcast. I have a very busy day. We're doing it early at a special earlier time because I'm very busy at this time of year. I am a Halloween first responder. Uh... I work for a Halloween store. I, 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 I try not to say the name of the company, but it's like, what other big name Halloween stores are out there other than the one that everybody knows? I work for them. I don't want to say the name. I work for them. It's the best job in the world. I, we play music, and I am singing and dancing the whole time I'm at work. The other day, they started playing music, and I'm like, this can't be. Is this? It can't be. Is this? Hell yeah, it was. 
They were playing Black Sheep by the Clash of Demon Head. Oh my God! No. Oh my God! It was a dance party. It was a it was a nightclub for one, and I'm just dancing and singing as loud as I can. It was the best. They were specifically playing the Brie Larson version too. Oh, it was so fun. And then after that, they played Everything Is Awesome from the Lego Movie. Oh, I love my job so much. So, uh, so I'm very busy. I have work later today. Normally, I would pack this opening with news and funny little bits and uh, at the top of my head that I thought that you would find funny. But not this week. See, this week I just want to talk. just want to talk about me, about you, Bunny, about us. I've got a lot going on in my life, Bunny. And you, in case you don't know, you're freaking Bunny. Yeah. You're Bunny. So well, there, are two, uh, there are definitely it, two things I, I've got to say this week. Okay. For one, okay. I am really enjoying myself some uh, shot of Freuden, if that's how you say that word, for for from Russell Brand. I, I'm I'm oh, really yeah. enjoying everything that Russell Brand is going through. Right. Yeah, now. he deserves all of I, that. Us. I Speaking. used to love Russell Brand, and then he turned into a freak, and now I'm just really enjoying this. Yeah, um, a FYI, uh, at Sophie Hagen on Twitter, uh, tweeted this. I'm not gonna say X, fuck Elon Musk. Uh, at Sophie Hagen on Twitter tweeted this, quote, if you were a rapist in 2017 and you saw the beginning of the Me Too movement, would you not instantly begin to build your defense? You know, no, that they'd be coming for you. Anyway, Russell Brand's last TV performance was filmed in September 2017 and broadcast in, December, in January 2018. And shortly after that, he started going far right. Oh, yeah. what a what a strange random happenstance. Yeah. Well, well, first he went guru, and that's where he lost me. Yeah. Where he was just pitching woo and magical thinking, and the universe is actually one big brain and stupid shit like that. And then mm -hmm. when that wasn't working for him, that's when he went far right. Yeah. And eat the horse paste and all that. Yeah, uh, my... Fucking Russell Brand. And then he posted a video uh, commenting on, on the, the controversy on Rumble. Yeah. Which is like the far-right Twitter. And then he got on Twitter and it's like, hey, uh, this is all a witch hunt. If you want to support me, follow me on Rumble because that's the only way we can get our freedom of speech. And Elon Musk is like, hey, what about X? Uh, fuck you, Russell Brand. So now they're all fighting, and I'm like the Japanese guy from uh, Legendary Pictures' first Godzilla film. Let them fight. Yes. Because I, I don't care. Let, let's have the two kaijus fight. I don't care who. I don't care who wins. I just care that hopefully they uh, do themselves away. So, so this is a. Is this a Jeff? This is like an acoustic Jeff. Yes. This one is. Where we sit back, we, we sit backwards in our chair. You get that analogy, right? So, so the, the whole podcast is now the cool youth pastor. Yes. Yes. Uh, and also, full disclosure, is there another word for thesaurus? I didn't write that. Uh, Father Tom at my Episcopalian church wrote that. Oh, I don't think he wrote that. Well, he probably saw it online somewhere. I don't know. But, um, yeah. October is coming up, and October 18th. As a matter of fact, isn't that like a Stephen Wright bit? Maybe, I don't know. I haven't seen Stephen Wright in a while. But, uh, it's almost October, so it's, it's coming up to my favorite time. Oktoberfest at church. We, uh, they make a bunch of, like, sauerkraut and, uh, like, like sausages and potatoes. 
and there's a bunch of free beer, which I don't partake of because I gave up drinking. And uh, Father Tom always gets really wasted. I, I confronted him about it, and I was like, oh, yeah, I came really late last year for Oktoberfest, and you were pretty wasted. And he said, I wasn't wasted, Mei Lin, but I did have six beers, so I was friendly. Okay. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, if, if, if that works for you. So I've got a lot of shit going on. Uh, I, I booked another performance. Yes. Very excited about that. I booked a second drag show on November 30th. I will be performing in uh, Ada, Oklahoma at their drag show, reading stories and telling my story and joking and having fun. And then um, rural Oklahoma Pride is already beginning to advertise their uh, big theme park show in 2024. Which I am a featured performer at. I'm very excited about that. And my job. Oh, I've been working there for over a month now. It is my absolute dream job. I have a million stories. A million stories. Yesterday, I was working, and this little boy came up, this little white boy, like four years old, and he just walked up and said, Excuse me, ma'am, why do you have so much spooky stuff at your store? And I said, Well, young man, that's because uh, there's a very spooky holiday coming up. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called Thanksgiving, and it's when I need to talk to my parents. Yes. <laughs> and the kid had no idea what I was talking about. He's like, I'm going to be a ninja for Halloween, a blue ninja. So he found a, he found a ninja sword in the children's area and he kept trying to kill me yeah and i kept being like oh you're killing me so finally at the end right when he's getting rung up and right before he leaves the little boy looks up at me and says you sound like a boy and like i froze because like i've worked here for over a month and so far no one has thought that I'm not a woman or question my gender or anything like that so like I breathe and the kid goes yeah you have a boy's voice but you're not a boy you're a girl isn't that funny and I'm like you bet it is I'm gonna quickly change the subject yes so that was fun the blue ranger is a rapist He's, he's not being, being the Blue, Blue Ranger, he's being a Blue Ninja. Change changed the subject. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's so much fun, and I absolutely love it, and oh man. When Thriller plays, you can bet your ass I'm going to be doing a bit of the dance. Yeah. Period. Period. Yesterday, we decided to all come in a theme, and... It, and I got to choose the theme, and I said, superheroes, we're going to come as superheroes, and I went as the Winter Soldier, and I was all weirded out about that, because it's like, not everybody knows who the Winter Soldier is, there's going to be two Supermans, a Batman, maybe a Spider-Man, and sure enough, there were two Supermen at work, but I don't think anybody, I don't think any customers recognized me. It was my first time yesterday working in the weekend, so... I am really nervous about, like, those last two weeks of October, though. Yeah, why? Working, working in a, ha like, working in a Halloween yeah. store the day before Halloween and the day of Halloween, that's going to be insane. It's going to be a Black Friday situation. I got really scared during my training because the training said, imagine... Two whole weeks of Black Fridays. And that's what it's like working at this store for the last two weeks of October. And that put a chill down my spine. Yeah. Scared the crap out of me. And also, I would just like to deny any allegations that I have been putting fake names on our donation wall. I absolutely have not. If you go on that donation wall, and on the bottom left, you see Trafani's, home of the sloppy steak, Don Bondarly, 
the king of dirty limericks, um, Bard Harley Jarvis, um, a good steering wheel that doesn't whiff out of the window while you're driving. I don't know who did those, but <laughs> definitely not me, the person who works there, who's obsessed with I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson. I don't know where these rumors get started. Uh, I auditioned for a play, Bunny! Yes, you did. Which was this now? Okay, so since the 1960s, my small-ass town has had a tiny little uh, community theater. And I've always seen that they're doing plays, and, and I, I always thought, I don't really act anymore. I'm not going to audition for any of these plays. Then, in 2020, they did Pippin. Okay. And I got pissed. Because if I knew before auditions that they were doing Pippin, oh, crap. I would have I would have auditioned for that. I would have auditioned for that twice. Because I love that musical. That's one of, like, the top four plays that I want to do before I die. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I am going to keep an eye out on all of the plays that they do and all of the auditions, and next time they do an audition for something that I might be interested in doing, I'm going to audition. So then last year, or was it this year? Last year? Anyway, they did the play Puffs, which is a comedic a parody of all of the Harry Potter books and I'm like hey I'm trans and J.K. Rowling's a piece of shit I'm going to audition there was a strict age limit okay of like they were looking for actors 16 to 25 I am nowhere near that so I didn't audition so I'm like okay I, I, I'm not going to audition for the Harry Potter parody but I am going to audition for something but then after that they're doing like Driving Miss Daisy? Like, what am I going to be in Driving Miss Daisy? Miracle on 34th Street? It, no. Uh, well, the Sound of Music? This is all white people shit. And I'm a trans-Latina. What parts yeah. are there for trans-Latinas in this very small, white, small Oklahoma town? Then I saw that they were doing the Miracle Worker, and I'm like, ah, this is more white people shit. I can't audition for the miracle worker. I'm a Hispanic trans woman. I can't be Ann Sullivan. I I'm, and I'm too old to be uh, what's her name. Um. Uh, but then I saw. Oh, there's a funny aunt. Oh, uh, there's a doctor. Oh, there's a uh, a maid. I can audition for that. So I auditioned, and now I'm just waiting for the cast list to go up. Uh, right now they're doing another play, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yeah. And uh, when they're done with that, I think, is when they're going to do the um, put the cast list up. So I'm all nervous for that. I, I started <coughs> injections of estrogen, which is very exciting. My leg is in super <coughs> pain. So that sucks. Midsommar is coming back into theaters. I have heard this. The director's for, cut. Yeah, for one night only in October, and I'm super excited. And, you know, I've really thought about Midsommar, and I, I posted this on the Facey pages, but that is what broke my egg, is the movie Midsommar. Like, all my life, I had been blissfully ignorant of the fact that I really was a woman. My parents did a really good job of hiding that from me and beating masculinity into me and hating me for, for being so sensitive and wanting to play with dolls and, and all of this sort of stereotypical girly stuff. But Watching Midsommar, I wanted to be Danny. I wanted to be the May Queen. So the movie means a lot to me, uh, yeah, yeah, genderish. No shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <coughs> From the second you saw that movie, you wanted to be the May Queen. Oh yeah, absolutely. So that that absolutely cracked my egg, which is a uh, like a, a trans term. And then uh, what else? Is it 
You know what? Is it? Yeah. It's like huh? a, that. That is a trans term, and that's like kind of a common experience. That there's like one sort of. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. It 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 doesn't happen to everybody, but but yeah. It there's usually something that you can point to where okay, like. The egg doesn't crack in the sense of I watched Midsommar and suddenly the entire shell exploded and I immediately realized I was trans, but the cracks began. Uh-huh. Okay. In the summer of 2019, the cracks began in my egg and that's what started me on my journey was how obsessed I became with Midsommar and how I just wanted that flower dress and that flower crown. Yes. And I just wanted to burn everything down and start anew. The idea of, uh, like the Mother Mother song, All My Troubles in a Burning Pile. Yeah. Like, as, that That seemed wonderful to me. As long as you stopped asking me to get into the bear costume. That's, yeah, I'm just yeah, you would have looked amazing. That. You would have looked amazing in the bear costume. You know what's fascinating, though? What is absolutely fascinating about being trans seeing who from my past has come back to support me and big a, be a big time ally and really support everything I do and who is now gone from my life. Yeah. This is fascinating. Like, okay, Wyatt is no longer my friend on Facebook. Okay, you started following me because of the Church of Ed Wood and now I guess you're gone because I'm trans? Seems a bit weird, but okay. You know how Ed Wood used to dress, right? You know what? It's <laughs> it's not a big deal. Aurelia from elementary school is back in my life, and she's a big supporter. And yeah. it's like, oh wow, this is cool. I wasn't expecting you to show up and become a big part of my life again. But hey, but wonderful to have you. I always liked you. Jono from high school is no longer my friend. It's like. I've known you since like my sophomore year of high school and we've been friends how is it that this is the thing that oh and then my high school girlfriend Stacy is back and she's all super supportive and stuff that's weird because yeah. I don't think that we talked from 1996 to like 2021 but okay so uh my cousin-in-law, Alicia, is gone. She was apparently a bigot. Uh-huh. And uh, it's, it's my wife Natasha's cousin, Alicia. And she's talking to uh, Auntie Lauren and saying, I don't know how Natasha does it. You know, what with uh, what's going on? And Auntie Lauren's like, what do you mean? It's like, oh, you know, between him, between her and Steve, I can't believe she would let Steve be a woman. And so we all cut her off, and 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 we're all better for it. Yay! Yay! Tom is back in my life. Tom and I talk really? regularly, a couple of times a week. Yeah, apparently Tom's wife is a gender doctor. And so he contacted me like a, a, a year ago. And was like, I'm so proud of you for living your truth. And then after that, we've just been talking. It's weird. Tom and I have a, a, a history. And then two of my oh, cousins oh, are no two, longer two, friends no, with me. Yeah? You, you yeah. two? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's a shocker. Newsflash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are we exes or not? It depends on who you ask. Yeah. Tom and I. But and then two of my cousins unfriended me on Facebook. Cousins. Straight up cousins. One from my mom's side and one from my dad's side. I can't believe this. I feel comfortable about the cousin from my dad's side unfriending me because she is uh one of a twin. Okay. And the other twin is still friends with me, so I feel like I never lost the one who decided to be a bigot. Yeah. You know? I still have one. Yeah. I've got one half of the twins. Like if you lose a kidney. 
You know? Yeah. 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 I still got another one, so that's fine. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about movies. Funny. Yes. Do we really need a Beetlejuice sequel? I don't. I, I didn't. Re- I wasn't that big of a fan of the first fucking Beetlejuice. See, I'm one of those people, and you don't see this a lot in Gen X people, but I loved Ghostbusters when I was a kid. I was obsessed with Ghostbusters. I wanted to be a Ghostbuster. And I bought this Ghostbuster Kids book because in the back they had an official Ghostbusters membership card. And I signed my name on it and I put it in my pocket and I carried it everywhere. I'm an official Ghostbuster. But you know what happened, buddy? What happened? I got fucking older. Yeah. I discovered smoking and women and men and porn, and I stopped caring about Ghostbusters. So many people in Gen X have something that they loved when they were a kid. I loved X. I love uh, He-Man. Yeah. And now I'm going to be a 20-year-old who loves He-Man and a 30-year-old who loves He-Man and a 40-year-old who's a He-Man collector and who's obsessed with He-Man. No, I loved He-Man when I was a kid. Then I fucking grew up. Well, that kind of plays into the second thing that I was really kind of wanting to bring up. Okay. Then I'm, I'm getting old. I'm just getting old, and I, I have had a little more confirmation here. Because okay. I had been going through Tubi, and I had been watching some some old, good old-fashioned 80s horror. I love Tubi for horror and B-movies and monster movies. They've got so much horrible shit on Tubi, and I love it. Yeah. And, like, especially for, for that kind of horror in the 80s, I was, like, right at that right age. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Late teens, early 20s, there we go. But now I'm watching it, and they come up to, like, a sex scene, which was always the selling part of a good 80s horror movie, and I'm just like, you're both kids! Stop it! Stop it! What are you doing? You're going to ruin your lives! Yeah, um... I'm I'm just just getting old. I, I, I... I, I feel like I just need to look away because they're, they're just, like, so young. Yeah. Um, and Natasha and I kind of had that same moment. We were watching, I think, one of the Friday the 13th. And it's like, are you really going to be smoking pot instead of taking care of these kids? You know what? You deserve the stabs. Yeah. Yeah. You deserve it. Yeah. You need to be keeping an eye, a better eye on these children, Kevin Bacon. Yeah, I, it's the same phenomenon I had noticed a few years back where, like, just in conversation when you're hanging out talking to people, there are things that you would say that, you know, they're kind of cute, they're kind of flirty, you know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. And one day I noticed I said something like that, and I was like, yeah, no. I've crossed the line. It is now fucking creepy. Don't ever yeah. say that again. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's ridiculous. Um, I am excited about this Friday, this upcoming weekend, which is Saw Patrol. Uh-oh. I didn't, I didn't particularly care to do Barbenheimer, because I just don't feel like watching Oppenheimer. I don't feel like watching a movie where it's like, yes, we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but we had to. And in a way, I'm a hero. You know, because that's what that movie was all about. It, the whole movie was just a way to justify dropping an atomic bomb. Yeah. And I didn't want I, I didn't want to see that. Didn't I didn't care thought, for it. I thought that it was like a really cute uh, marketing idea since so, such drastically different movies were coming out on the same day but yep. man by the time it came to release time I was so fucking sick and tired of of Barbenheimer shit yeah but like, like I am this hoping... joke is 
way worn out now. Yeah. So I'm hoping that this Thursday, and if not Thursday, sometime during the weekend, I will be able to go see the new Paw Patrol film, and then immediately after that, go and see Saw X. I'm really excited about Saw X. Shawnee Smith is back as Amanda, and the movie is set um, like a like a week after the first film. Okay. So they say that they want to call it Saw 2, but I'm very excited. Uh, John Kramer knows that he has cancer. He goes to Mexico because he's heard of this miracle cure, but all the people who are doing the miracle cure are just uh, con artists robbing people of money, so he decides to get all John Kramer with him. I'm excited about that. And it focuses heavily on John Kramer's relationship with Amanda, and so I am all psyched for this. One of the good things about working in a Halloween store, my freaking movie knowledge and this podcast helps me out so much. Yeah. Good. And someone came in and it's like, do you have any Saw merchandise? And I'm like, we've got a mask over here. Are you excited about Saw X? What, are you, what were your thoughts about the movie Jigsaw? I actually didn't mind Chris Rock's take on it. And their mouths are like hung open. I talked to this one guy for like 10 minutes about the three creep show movies. Yeah. And he was blown away by that. You're the only woman that I've ever met who loves all the Halloween movies. And it's like, yeah. Where's my cake, Bedelia? <laughs> love, love those movies. And also, I can respect the fact that, that George Romero and Stephen King said, we want to do a Tales from the Crypt movie. Let's just make our own. But now, okay, you know? so Creepshow 2. Okay, Creepshow 2. One That's the one with the Indian and, and with the, the black stuff in the, the, in the lake. The raft, yeah. yeah. So, way before this movie came out, okay, where Stephen King was... He was getting there, you know? He was building yeah. up in popularity. And, and, I had read, the and I had read a few of his books, so I was a fan. So I'm coming home from work, and I stop in the 7-Eleven for probably beer, let's just say. Uh, chances okay. are good. 99% I was stopping for beer, okay? Uh, and I saw behind the counter where they kept the, the dirty magazines then. Mm-hmm. I saw on one of the covers, short story by Stephen King. Heck yeah, okay. And this was, yeah, like this was one of those magazines, the, one of those magazines that just really makes you feel dirty buying it, you know? Yeah. Where, where it's just like, all the pictures are taken by the girl's abusive boyfriend, from meth yeah. Money, you know? Yeah. It was yeah. one of these. But I bought it because I'm a fan. I'm a true fan, damn it. And it was it was the raft, and it was like an insert of God knows how many pages, like a little booklet. Huh. And that's where that's, I first read the sta- read, read the raft. That's awesome. I bought a issue of... If I ever issue of- Stephen King, I'm telling him that one. Yeah. I bought an issue of Playboy magazine when I was working in the children's department of the bookstore, and I felt really uncomfortable going to the register as Mr. Steve and buying an issue of Playboy magazine. But I needed to, because I was putting the magazines away, and on the cover it mentioned Manos, the Hands of Fate. So I bought it, and there was a lengthy article about the intense legal battle between who owns the damn rights to Manos in the Hands of Fate right now? Yeah. Some people claim they do. Some people, some like a, a Jackie is trying to keep her hand on it because she was in the movie. She was the little girl and her dad was the master. Yeah. But, but she tries to say she has the rights because she was in it, but that doesn't mean she has the rights, you know? Yeah. It's all sorts of confusing, her, and it's like Dad make it isn't wasn't it his movie? I think so. I'm, I I don't remember that. W- it was a long time since I worked at the bookstore, but I love that article. Yeah. 
And then some, some guy claimed to be uh, the reincarnated spirit of Hal P. Warren and that he should own the rights, which is nonsense, but it's nonsense befitting Manos. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, I, before the time cuts out, I saw a wonderful movie called Theater Camp recently. I absolutely fell in love with it. It's about a theater camp for talented young kids, but the founder is in a coma and the the camp might be losing its funding and they have to find a way to save the camp and it's adorable and funny and I'm not sure if it, it was laugh out loud funny for me. I'm not sure if it was laugh out loud funny for me because I have a theater background, but it, it a lot of it was ad lib, so it feels like a very theater centric Christopher Guest movie. Yeah. And I really, really liked it and enjoyed it, and it's one of my top ten favorite movies of the year. It's highly quotable. My wife and I are quoting it like crazy. Love this movie. Theater Camp. It it, it had a very limited release in theaters, and I wasn't willing to drive an hour and a half to go see it. So I waited for it to be a download, and it just came out as a download. Wonderful film. Wonderful film. Absolutely love it. Uh, so there's no hap this week. Because I'm very busy and I didn't write one. Um, but there will be a mini half during the discussion of this week's movie because there were some legal issues with this film and we are going to be talking about that. We're also going to be talking about monster lineage. Like, who was the parent of the beast from 20,000 Fathoms? And who was the beast from 20,000 Fathoms kid? Yeah. We're going to get all into that. And uh, I'm very excited to talk about this week's movie. Also, uh, spoiler alert, during our discussion of the movie, I will be talking about my sexual awakening. Okay. I saw a Pedro... Almodovar film. For, for me, it was when the girls threw over their, their bathing suits in the water tower in the opening of Petticoat Junction. I knew that. Nice. They were I know I exactly what scene that is. It. Yeah, yeah um, for me, it was literally a Pedro Almodovar film. Yeah. Okay. That I should not have seen at such a young age, but we're going to get into that when we discuss the film. So we are going to be taking uh, like about a 10 minute break because we record the Sons of and so uh, we're going to take a short break. There's going to be some music, some cartoons, some fun. When we come back, we are going to be discussing the works of legendary Spanish director Pedro Almodovar by discussing the 1953 American monster movie The Beast from 20,000 Adam. I feel like it's been a while since our podcast has done something so strangely meta. Yes. And I'm happy that we're doing this. I have a biography of, of Pedro that we're going to get into, and I think you're really going to have fun. Cool. But uh, first, maybe we should take a break. Should we take a break? We should take a break. I concur. We will be right back with more of the Bobon film. After this, you do not have clothes on. Do not get in front of this camera. You are just in underwear. I don't want us to get in trouble. Do 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 do. It's it's difficult to record this right now because literally the only people that are awake are Eleanor. Yeah. Everyone else is still asleep. Souls. It's me, Ali. Fucking alien. If you come to a fate of mine be, you'll be treated like family. Just family we don't like very much. There's a cheap hotel downtown, only five grand a month. It's kind of a rough area, so bring a gun. Just don't let anybody see you with a gun. They'll shoot you if they think you have a gun. Let 
just be straight with you. Let's judge me here. If you find yourself in the mood for a hooker, do yourself a favor and stick to your body parts. I mean, we're all crudded up to one degree or another. Oh, keep in mind, one in five people here are raving fucking lunatics. So don't talk to anyone. Don't ask anyone for the time. Don't mention the weather. And for the love of God, don't make eye contact with anyone. probably going to want to bring your own food. Eating here is kind of like Russian roulette. Some places claim to be government inspected, but with a failing government, what does that mean? Kentucky water. Maybe don't come here. Instead, how about you watch these videos from Undead Cow Studios and the Pope on Film. Okay, so I'm going to show you one of my favorite books in the world, and it's right here, and it's called Heaven is Real and Fun by Kim Robinson, and then here's the subtitle. It actually says, you don't float around wearing diapers and eating grapes. I love this book so much. This woman believes that, like literally believes that when she prays, Jesus takes her from earth and lets her play in heaven. Uh, here's what the back says. Since 1988, the Holy Spirit has been taking me to heaven. Jesus would show me various fun places and allowed me to do fun things. I asked, why, ha why was he showing me these places? Daddy slash God said, because people think all they do here is float around wearing diapers, eating grapes, or doing nothing but bowing before me. Okay, so this is my favorite passage of the book, and it's called Play Gel Balls. Okay. I'm not sure if this, hold on, I'm going to do this in two parts. Okay. Are you ready for this? This morning while worshiping, I was caught up in the spirit and stepped over into heaven when I heard Jesus say, Come play gel balls. It's like a water balloon, but the ball is full of giggly joy gel. You can squeeze it into yourself. When you put one in yourself, you laugh intensely. You're in the, in the spirit realm. You can place things into yourself as if you were transparent. When you try to hit the other person with these joy gel balls, they try to get hit. So it will go into them, and they will intensely laugh. They can also catch it and squeeze it into themselves. Intensely laugh and keep playing. Heaven is so fun and filled with intense laughter. This reminded me of Job 8.21 that says, he will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with joyful shouting. Hello there. Yeah, so anyway, I love this book. I love this book so much. And a lot of people have asked me, why do you love this book so much? And, and the thing that I love about this book is that it, this isn't a joke. This person actually believes... Uh, chapter 2, Daddy, God, and the Holy Spirit in Heaven. It, this woman actually believes that she can leave Earth and travel to Heaven where she has a vaguely uh, a high sexual tension relationship with Jesus. There's a passage in here where she's slow dancing with Jesus fragrance of Jesus like this woman wants to bang our Lord and Savior and I, I just love this it, it, oh, I, I just Jesus is in me Jesus is in me this woman wants to bang Christ and I just love this book because if 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 you're on the street and you're pushing a shopping cart and the police ask you what's up with you 
And you say, oh, I, I, I've been talking to Jesus. He takes me. He takes me to, uh, to roller coasters. Roller coasters in heaven. You don't uh, just float around on a cloud wearing divers and eating grapes. Then you'd be put in an institution or a prison and you'd rot in there for the rest of your life. But if you're an old white woman and you say those things, then uh, congratulations, you're a prophet. It's it's insane. This woman is clearly insane. Hey, everybody, it's me, Mickey Mouse. Say, you want to come inside? You want to come inside? You want to come inside? Oh, my God! Wow! Want to see a real weasel? Elon fucking Musk. Trust fun baby born with a silver spoon in his mouth who considers himself a self-made man thinks he's too good to pay taxes. Yeah, this two-bit Tony Stark who cosplays as a working class hero had the balls to say, if they come for my money, they'll be coming for yours next. Like, we haven't been getting fisted by this government's infinity gauntlet for the last four decades. Bitch. Don't dare pretend to be one of us if you can't even pay your taxes. But then again, we wouldn't name our kids this. Whatever the fuck this is. Christ's sake. We feel you, little... this. You dad's a large lump of selfish piece of shit. And we suffer along with you, little man. He'll have us all killed as soon as we're finished building his life supporting Dome City. At least you'll have your therapist to dump all the vitriolic bile you've built up towards a narcissistic father who doesn't know how to show love. Eat the rich. And now, please enjoy this video from our good friend, Liz a Day. She pays taxes.
I think I'm gonna procrastinate a little bit more. Oh, oh, I'll hit no but strings without my right hand. Using my left hand, singing. I need to quit singing so I can start drinking. Here I go. Dark in the city, night is a while. Steam in the subway, the world is on fire. Do 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 do. Woman, you want me? Give me a sign. Catch my breathing, even close up behind. Do 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 do. With the ground, I'm a hot down after you. I smell like a sound, I'm lost in a crowd, and I'm hungry like I was. Cross the line, a discord and rhyme. I'm on a hunt down after you. My mouth is alive with juices and wine, and I'm hungry like I was. <laughs> oh. Stuck in the forest, too close behind to be a bunny by the moonlight side. Do 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 do. Have a drum made on your skin so tight. You feel my heat. I'm just a moment behind. Do 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 do. In touch with the ground. I'm on a hunt down after you. I smell like a sign. I'm lost and I'm found, and I'm hungry like the wolf. I straddle the line, a discord and rhyme, howling and whining after you. My mouth is alive, I'm running inside, and I'm hungry like the wolf. It's discord and rhyme, 'cause I'm on a hunt down after you. My mouth is alive with juices and wine. I'm on a hungry like the wolf, burning the ground, break from the crowd. I'm on a hunt down after you. I sense the sound, I'm lost and I'm found, and I'm hungry like the wolf, crunching the line, a discord and rhyme. I'm on a hunt down after you. My mouth is alive, I run inside, and I'm hungry like the wolf. Oh no, I bust a sweat doing that song. <sighs> that deserves a drink. Don't mind if I do. So until next week, this is so wrong. Who got a problem with me? Bum 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 bum
say there are things better left unsolved. Who knows what waits for us in nature's no man's land? Impossible, unbelievable, fantastic. But I tell you, it could happen. It could happen. It could happen. It could happen. Yes, it could happen. For various authorities believe that buried somewhere under the polar ice cap, in a state of suspended animation, are the awesome creatures, the leviathans that roamed the earth at the dawn of time. And under certain conditions, a nuclear explosion could free one from his icy tomb. Then, guided by instinct, the beast would come back, back to the caverns of the deepest Atlantic where it was spawned. An armored giant wreaking his prehistoric fury on modern man and his puny machines. Cities would be terrorized by the cruel intruder from the past. Populations crazed and panicked with fear by its destructive force. Granite and steel would crumble. Soldiers and their weapons would be powerless before the onslaught of the beast. The beast, the beast, the beast from 20,000 fathoms. Herald Square, 34th Street, Broadway. Every section of the city is guarded. No one knows where the monster will strike next. Another one, Colonel? No. You know where the radioactive isotope is? No, but if it can be loaded, I can fire it. I'll load it. Just remember one thing. This is the only isotope of its kind this side of Oak Ridge, so you can't miss. And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. It's time, buddy! It's time! It's time! Yes, buddy, my friend, it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film podcast to boot scoop boogie our way into the final half of our big shoe. And it is said final half, wherein we finally, in eventually, get around to discussing our all new low, fat, and high movie of the week. And this week, we begin our four week tribute to the one and only uh, Bunny Williams with yet another Buntober celebration. Yes. That's when Bunny, for four episodes, or sometimes five, six, I don't know, where Bunny takes over the show. And this year, Buntober is a celebration of the works of legendary Spanish director Pedro Almodovar. And we will be celebrating him by watching the 1953 American monster flick known as The Beast. The Beast. The Beast from 20,000 Adams. Yes. That was a scary scary close-up that I just did, but that's fine. Bunny, would you care to explain Buntober this year? Uh, well, I... Uh, Pedro Almodovar is one of those directors that I've really been meaning to get to for quite a lot of years, but 
hey, you know, you got to wait in line. You know, there's Alejandro Jodorowsky. You know, you got to get behind him, man. You know? Um, yeah. Westerns, you have to get behind that. Black, black cinema. You know, so yeah. Pedro waited his turn patiently, uh, and I decided that this was the year to finally get to the great works of Pedro Almodovar. Uh, little, little known in America because we're racist and he's Spanish, um, and this was this was going to be the year. So I went and I tracked down a bunch of, a really good selection of Pedro Almodovar films. They were all in Spanish, none of them subtitled. So, you know, after not having sex with the hot chick, you go home to your wife. And in this case, my wife is B-50s movies. Weed. So if I had a penny what we're doing. for every, if I had a penny for every 1950s B movie that started with a bunch of boring narration, I would have a dollar, which is not a lot of money, but that's a shitload of pennies. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those films. But before we get to this week's film, the Beast, the Beast, the Beast. Yes. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Uh, I have decided that's the way I'm going to say it for the rest of this podcast. Um, let's talk about the man in question, Mr. Pedro Almodovar. There's no... I keep wanting to pronounce Pedro Almodovar, but that's not his name. It's yeah. Pedro Almodovar, and I have a hard time saying that because that's how wide I am. I'm too white for the browns and too brown for the whites. Um, but I consider myself a huge, big-time, bigly film historian. Yes. So we're going to do a quick bio of Pedro. Should come easy for me, with no mistakes, nudge, nudge, <coughs> wink, quick, no to me. So here is... In, in very simple terms, the life of Pedro Almodovar. He was born in Da Nang, South Vietnam in 1966. His family fled the country right before the fall of Saigon, few, and uh, Pedro would grow up to become a Silicon Valley software, software salesman. But he loved the movies. He especially loved the movies of Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. So, uh, he would get his money from his work as a software salesman. He had a lot of money, enough money to be able to make some uh, low-budget movies, and he made a few. Then in 2010, he got his big break with his major film, Birdemic. Oh, wait. I may have fucked this up. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. No, this isn't Pedro Almodovar. This is... Uh, James Nguyen, the man who made the Birdemic Trilogy. Uh-oh. Trilogy. There's three of them. But um, I, I'm sure that at the next episode, where we continue our tribute to Pedro Almodovar, I'm sure I'll get the bio Yes. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, no to me. Uh, before we discuss the beast, I have a very personal Pedro Almodovar story. Okay. So, um, my mom, my mother, Teresa, Terry, she's still very much alive. Uh, she considered herself a very, very prim and proper woman. And she tried to have dinner ready for her husband by the time her husband came home from work. And, you know, she dressed up nice and she did her hair and she always dyed her hair black to hide the white hairs and and she was always very prim and proper a very prim and proper young woman but when she got with her relatives she could drink like 
two and a half Chris Farley's. Okay. It was freaking insane. And like, there would be like a family gathering and like they would be drinking and partying and drinking and going, and I'm like, I'm going to bed and I go to bed and then I wake up at like 7 a.m. and there's a massive pyramid of all the beers that they had drank. Just this big, massive pyramid. They always made a pyramid with their beers. And my mom would get sloppy ass drunk. Just drunk as fuck with her uh, brothers and uh, sisters. She'd get wasted. Uh, so in, most of the time this would happen in Douglas, Arizona, which is where most of my uh, family is from, from my mother's side. And they would stay up late drinking and... and uh, I have a lot of cousins, so many cousins, and it was difficult because we would all stay in my grandparents' house, and so there's a guest bedroom, and some people could sleep there, and then there's a couch, some people could sleep there, but a lot of times we would end up just sleeping on the floor of the living room, and so we were sleeping on the floor of the living room when, late at night, um, HBO decided to show... Pedro Almodovar's Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down. Okay. Uh, so I saw that movie when I was about 11. Maybe 12. Yeah. Probably 11. Um, I should not have been seeing this film. No, you shouldn't. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Antonio Banderas. Yes. He is this guy, and he's in a mental institution, and he gets released from the mental institution. Um, he says he's cured, but he's not cured. Uh, he believes that God has told him that his mission in life is to marry this famous celebrity and to have kids with her. So he kidnaps this woman, ties her up, ties her down, and uh, tries to force her into falling in love with him and there's a lot of nudity and a lot of graphic sex scenes there's a specific scene in a bathtub with a wind up doll toy that was burned into my brain I should not have seen this film and then you were staying in, in Douglas, Arizona for like a week and you know how HBO is They've got like a handful of movies and they just keep playing them over and over again. So I ended up watching Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down like three or four times when I was 11 years old and I should not have watched it. What I'm saying is, um, number one, this was my sexual awakening. Yes. On the floor of my grandparents' bedroom, which is a horrible place to do it. And number two, um, I am so happy that we will be spending four episodes uh, celebrating the life of Pedro Almodovar by not watching his movies. <laughs> because I don't think I can watch Tiny Me Up, Tiny Me Down again. See, now, when Weird. I say that if I had watched Boxing Helena at the right time and the right place, yep. mm -hmm. I'm talking about Tiny Me Up, Tiny Me Down. Yeah, okay. I, I get that. Because I get that. That movie is fucking genius. I saw it pre, you know, I saw it when it first hit video. Yeah. You know, and it, it had gotten a lot of critical acclaim and stuff like that before it. Uh, I believe Siskel and Ebert both liked it. You know, so so I definitely checked it out. That's not that was not the first Pedro Almodovar story movie I had seen. The first was in 1990. I had just returned to school at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. And okay. I was wanting to get, because like I didn't take a language in high school, so I had to get yeah. the language requirement out of the way. So I was like, alright, yeah. fuck it. I'll, I'll sign up for the Spanish class. You know, I mean, having no particular interest other than just making the credit, you know? Yeah. So, uh, of course, for some reason, with me and school, when I decide to take a class, especially if it's something as completely normal 
as Spanish, okay? Yeah. The school system has always decided to fuck with me then. Hmm. So they had decided that they had this new teaching technique for their Spanish class in which they would not speak English at all. Everything would be in Spanish. I so hated that. So you can that. just absorb it. I hated them doing that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm so not much. paying you for me to absorb shit. I'm paying you to yeah. teach me shit. Yeah. So I did horrible, and I felt like a fucking moron, because everybody in the world can learn Spanish except for me. You know? And me! <laughs> yeah, right? And me. Both uh, of us together. But the one saving grace is that the teacher... A grad student, an undergrad, whatever the fuck he really was. He was a guy who was walking by one day, he, he could speak Spanish, and like, here, you have a class now. But he was a real film fanatic, and he was planning on going off to film school at some point. So, a lot of the times, we would watch a Spanish language movie with subtitles. Okay. Okay, so. Which like, movie did you see? Uh, for for that class, we had watched one of his really early works. What did I ever do to deserve this? Or what did I do to deserve this? Nice. Which was okay. which is more of a screwball comedy. Yeah. And unlike a, a, any of his other work, really. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but that was it. That was the start with me and Pedro Almodovar. Fascinating. Fascinating. That's the difficult thing with downloading movies is that I downloaded the director's cut of Midsommar. And so it's like, oh, sweet. Now I have this movie. I am going to watch it. There ain't no subtitles when you just download a movie. Yeah. I Like I need the DVD in order to really get the subtitles going. Yeah. So it's difficult. And, but and you can get the subtitle file, but I don't know what the fuck to do with it. Same. No idea. Yeah. Absolutely no idea. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But there you are. And that, of course, brings us to The Beast. The Beast. The Beast from 20,000. Oh. Well, well now, now wait just before that. You know, because I did download four Pedro Almodovar movies. So this is all about my mother from 1999. But it's to be some 2,000 fathoms. 20,000 okay. fathoms. Yes, all about my mother. A.K.A. The all 19, about my mother. The 1999 comedy drama. Yes. Uh... This film was a commercial and critical success internationally, winning the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. I'm surprised that uh, MAGAs haven't gotten upset and demanded that America wins Best Foreign Language Film. I, yeah. Seems like something they would do, doesn't it? Uh, it's hard to even fathom anymore what they might do. You know, it's no, it's tough to fathom what they wouldn't do. Yeah, yeah. So, um, here is the story of uh, the lineage of the beast from 20,000 Fathoms in 1952. They re released King Kong into movie theaters, they re released King Kong, and it was a smash hit. People were lining up around the block to go see uh, uh, King Kong, even though it was, you know, decades old at this point. Yeah. People were excited to see it. And so Warner well, like Brothers... Star Wars. Yeah, like Star yeah. Wars. Like Star Wars. And so uh, Warner, Bro Warner Bros, I think that's how you pronounce it, Warner Bros, yeah. was all, somebody get me a King Kong ripoff. And then when you're done, 
get me pictures of Spider-Man. So, uh, boom. One year later, in 1953, in 1952, they re-released King Kong. A year later, in 1953, Warner Bros. releases The Beast of 20,000 Fathoms, and that's so successful that Toho sees the beast from 20,000 Fathoms and says, someone get me a beast from 20,000 Fathoms ripoff. It's Japanese. And boom, one year later in 1954, we get Gojira. And that, so it's really weird that King Kong and Godzilla would fight twice in movies yeah. when they're kind of related. Because mm -hmm. King Kong is the dad of the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, and then the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms has a kid, and that's Godzilla. But King Kong keeps coming back. Godzilla sure as shit keeps coming back. But as far as I can tell, the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is the deadbeat dad who left for smokes and never came back. That's, that is about it. It's very sad. Yeah. But I love this Much movie. Ran just... off with Gorgo. Yes, with Gorgo. Yes, very much so. Because Gorgo had that British accent that was just so fucking sexy. <laughs> yeah, 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 he was hot. Yeah. Uh, so here's a little mini chat. Uh, Raymond Frederick Harryhausen. Yes. I'm using his full name out of respect. Raymond Frederick Harryhausen was BFFs with... Raymond Douglas Bradbury, yes. the famous author. So Bradbury visits Harryhausen on the set, and it's like, hey, I was in the neighborhood, thought I'd see you on the set and say hello. What are you working on? And Harryhausen is all, oh, just this monster <laughs> flick called uh, Monster from the Sea. And Bradbury says, oh, interesting. Can I uh, read the script? Maybe I can do a rewrite on, on it. And Harryhausen says, sure, gives him the script. And uh, Raymond uh, uh, Raymond Douglas Bradbury is reading the script. And he's all, huh, this script sounds a bit familiar. Yes. Uh, it seems to be a ripoff of my short story, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, that I wrote for the Saturday Evening Post. Hmm. What should I do about this? Should I tell my manager? Should I confront Raymond Frederick Harryhausen, my good friend? Should I, should I sue? What should I do? But he wasn't able to decide what to do because... A day later, uh, it's 1950, so uh, he gets a telegram from Warner Bros. Mr. Bradbury, stop. We wish to purchase the rights to your story, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Stop. We will pay $2,000. Stop. Please respond. Stop. And Bradbury was all like, well, that answers that fucking question. Yeah. And so a year later, after The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms came out, when it was time to reprint, when it was time to reprint the story from the Saturday Evening Post, hey, we want to publish this story in this book of yours, Mister Raymond Brad Douglas Bradbury. Uh, Bradbury's like, do me a favor, retitle the story "The Foghorn," which I think is kind of catty of him. Yeah. I think he's still a little bit upset about uh, having his story being made into a movie before they even asked for the rights to the story. Yeah, he, That's he be really should have thought about that a little more because, because he's got them over a fucking barrel. Yeah, he does. You know, they have already invested a lot of money in making this movie and now yeah. they're going to go get the rights for it? Well, I know, that's thank ridiculous. God they realize they do have to go get the rights. But At least. Yeah. 
So, so yeah. they're doing it right. They're just doing it half-assed. But yeah, you say no, they're fucked. Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely have them over a barrel. So get Bunny. over your hurt feelings and built the motherfuckers. Hell yeah. It's like, you know what? You can have the rights to my store. You can have them for free. You just need to do something for me. Get the Animaniacs out of the fucking water town. <laughs> I was going to say fuck a pig on live TV. Eh, either or. Either or, really. So, Bunny, I know this is going to be difficult because there's so much substance. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> within this film. Ah, oh, man, the twists, the turns. But do you think it could be possible, using your might and your knowledge, Yes. do you yes. think it would be possible for you to regale us with the plot of The Beast of 20,000? From 20,000. The Beast! The Beast! The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms! Oh, it looks like you uh, knocked hey. out your camera. Oh, yeah. I, I pressed a button. There you go. There you go. Hello! Oh. Uh, these, these extreme close-ups are difficult. So there's a beast. He comes to New York. He fucks Where is he from? Where is he from? We, and is then he from? we kill him. That is basically the plot. Now, the rest of the padding is... Uh, there is a military expedition to the Arctic where a man sees this creature and is hurt in like an avalanche, something like that, lands in the hospital. We, we will forget his friend that got crushed to death. Not important. Never brought up again. Uh, yeah. But then he is in a hospital. He's trying to tell people that he saw this giant creature, and nobody will believe him. He, but and, huh. but he he pulls the card. He pulls the "Don't you know who I am?" card, which is yeah. I'm a scientist. Therefore, I cannot possibly be hallucinating this. So yeah. whatever. But now he is obsessed to prove that he actually saw what he saw. Um, that he isn't crazy. That he isn't crazy, yes. Uh, he hooks up with a hot paleontologist chick. Somehow, I forget how, does it fucking matter? There, Not really. There's so many hot paleontologists out there. Yeah. You know, when, when they need a supermodel for the runway, they just head to paleontologist bars. Yes. Of which there are many. Luckily, she had a, a huge collection of giant monster mug shots. Like you do when you're that, a paleontologist. That, yeah. that, that he had gone through... the. He, she made lovely little sandwiches. She made lovely. Little, they they were cut on the diagonal with the crust cut off. Just yeah. Donna Reed would be so proud of her. You know? Very much. Yes, very yes. much so. Um. So he eats a sandwich, and they they go through the they go through the giant monster mugshot book. Oh, my chill. favorite part is when my favorite part is when the paleontologist then got all of the monsters in a lineup. Yes. And they basically recreate the the opening of the usual suspects. Yes. One of the monsters keeps farting and that's why they're laughing at the scene. Yes. And if it turned out that Beast from 20,000 Fathoms took a nap in the jail cell. Yeah. He took a nap in the jail cell, so we knew he's the one who knocked over the truck. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> my my favorite part of the movie, my favorite part of the Beast of 20,000 Fathoms is when the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms starts killing all of the other monsters who were involved in the Lufthansa heist. 
and you yeah. see like a monster in a freezer and then you see one drowned and the whole time they're playing the beautiful piano music from Layla. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant cinema. Yes. <laughs> do, 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 do. You see all the monsters. You see one shot dead in his car. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Uh, uh, the, I frightened the, my own day. The monster attacks the ship, a la Godzilla. He also mm -hmm. attacks a lighthouse. Uh, he attacks some other shit along his way. Now, meanwhile, our scientist guy is trying to track down somebody else who has seen this monster. The guy from the shipwreck didn't want to talk to him. Oh, ten minute warning. Holy fuck. We're okay. having fun. Uh, but anyway, he finds another guy. I think he was from the lighthouse. I forget where he was from. But he, they found him in the hospital... And he was all crying and whining, man, man, nobody believes me, everybody thinks I'm nuts, it's all in my head. And he was like, oh, no, no, I believe you, I believe you, and oh, we all love you, but here, look through this book and see if, see if you can identify Kaiser Sose. So, he goes through the book, and God damn it, he picks out the same monster, the same giant monster from the giant monster mugshot book. So and then that's it. That's it now. That's all you need. Everybody believes them now, uh, including the white-haired scientist. Which yeah. white-haired scientist is going to pop up in a few of these movies? Oh yeah. Played by different people, but still, white-haired scientist. That's yeah. him. So he's like, oh my god, there's a monster on the loose. Call the call the Pentagon. Uh, and he calls the the guy from the expedition, whatever it was, um, Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, of Star Command. Of Star Command, yes. <clears throat> and tells him, this is real, we have to mobilize the, the army, and then that's, oh. what, that's what he does. He mobilizes the army, and then they look and see how he's attacking things down the coastline, so he's going to attack New York. And he does. And the blood is poisonous or some shit? I Pulls guess, off yeah. gaseous fumes, so they can't shoot it. Uh, they get Lee Van Cleef to shoot... Yeah, him. Lee Van Cleef! Yeah. He got a credit, Crazy. but like that was his only fucking scene. Yeah. Lee Van Cleef is in this. There's so many character actors in this. And he wore a big fucking hood through most of it. Yeah. Freaking Lee Van Cleef. You hire Lee Van Cleef for one reason and one reason only, and it's that fucking face. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm hmm? In the beginning of the movie, there are two people who have the first lines. The second one, the second person who has the second line in the movie, he's a radar technician. That's Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane. Really? Yeah. Nice. And then, like, I'm looking at the doctors in the hospital, and it's like, that one seems familiar. That one seems familiar. I gotta look this shit up. And sure enough, one of the doctors at the hospital who dismisses our hero owned McDougal's House of Horrors in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Oh. He's the pissed off McDougal guy. And then the character of George Ritchie in this, he was the director of the Vita, Vita Mita Vegemin commercial in I Love Lucy. Okay. It was a director. I love this movie, but also, it's still a monster movie. Yeah. But you know what? I would like someone to see someone with talent in time. I would like someone to, because everything, everywhere, all at once is such a wonderful film. We actually sell rhinestone-studded 
Elvis jumpsuits at my work at the Halloween store. Yeah. And I've been thinking about purchasing one of those, dyeing my hair pink, and just carrying around a black bagel. And everyone will think I'm Elvis with a bagel and pink hair, when in fact, my costume is Jobu Tapaki. I think that would be great. Nice. But... Somewhere out there, there's an alternate universe where Godzilla never existed, and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms got all of the Godzilla sequels. Yeah. So, there's uh, the uh, uh, Gigantus, the Fathoms monster. Yeah. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms versus King Kong. Uh... A, a, a whole bunch of them. I could 100%. I can, if I pay attention and close my eyes and focus, I can see all of those movies. Because this is very basically an American ripoff of Godzilla before Godzilla. Yes. That is surprising that Godzilla got like 500 movies and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms got one. The only real well, thing this movie has going in its favor is Ray Harryhausen. I would rather have his stop motion than some of the CGI that I see in movies today. Yeah. Because at times, this monster looks fucking realistic as shit. Yeah. But at, at right now, at this time in the year of our Lord, 2023, you see a CGI monster... You know it's a fucking CGI monster. Yeah, but the, the, but the thing is, is like that's all him. You know, that's yeah. like, like he went more. He went beyond just like animating it. He he was the one who was like, wouldn't it be funny if he got his foot stuck in a car? And there's a realism to that. He gets his foot stuck in a car. He scrapes it off, and then his tail drags the car. That's a level of realism that was not necessary that he specifically put in to make this look real. Yeah. And I and it was just him. It was just that one guy. And I freaking love that. I love this movie, but at its heart, it's still a monster movie. But yeah. watching this film just makes me really appreciate Pedro Almodovar. Yes. You know? What an amazing film. I have to tell you this, Bunny. I have been having a hard time paying attention to our discussion of the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms because I keep staring at the flashing light in the middle of the smoke <laughs> like a fucking moth to flame. Yeah. I have just been staring at it. It is blind. It's calling me. I am going to cover it up. So, so I can focus on the ending. There you go. Whew, that is so much better. I can still see the flashing in my eye. Yeah. That, that one's uh, not quite done yet. It, it looks good, good, though. Yeah, thank you. It looks good. It looks like the 1980s HBO logo needs to come out of it. Yeah. Or uh, Thor and Loki. <laughs> Either or. Uh, so, Bunny... Next week, we say next week, but it's two weeks from now. Next week, what is our movie? Next week, instead of Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, from, I believe, off the top of my head, 1988, um, again, critically acclaimed Pedro Almodovar movie, we will be doing the giant ant movie, Them. Yes. Damn. It is up on the cough cough. Uh, strongest female performance in a movie of this type ever by a child. We should we should do a uh, theme summer where we just do pronoun movies. We watch. Them, we watch it, the yeah. two it's, we watch us. Okay. 
It's, it's, it's just, just a whole summer of pronouns. pronouns. I, can't I can't think of any other ones. ones. There's, There's got to be some movie out there called E. Hour. Those movies have to exist. I'll try and figure it out. We can cheat and find a French movie. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Um, so, so that, that is next week. We will be celebrating the film Woman on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown by watching the Giant Ant movie, Bam. Very excited about that. But now that I look back at this, uh, Sexual Awakening, Virginic, uh, Raymond Douglas Bradbury, The Miracle Worker, Saw Patrol. I got to say, I think this has been a pretty good episode. This has been a damn good episode. You, you know, know what? I, 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 I concur. I concur, I concur with, with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And, and I got, got this. this. And I am Reverend May Lynn, and on behalf of Eleanor and uh, everybody else who might be asleep, I just want to say thanks for listening, and we... Ooh.